I'd like to start by thanking each of you for making time to join us today and for your patience bearing with us as we were troubleshooting these audio issues. Although you can't see the audience here, you're not alone in this virtual space. We are expecting a full house today with nearly 800 of you attending from New York and 31 other American states, Canada, Lithuania, Australia, the UK, just to name a few. You are educators, state and local agency workers, researchers, service providers, lawyers, advocates, all brought together by your interest in advancing social justice for our youth. Feel free to introduce yourself and say hello in the chat. An important housekeeping item. Right about now, you should be seeing an arrow pop up and point to two very little lines on your screen. If you click and drag those lines, you'll be able to resize the appearance of the speakers. Last but not least, I wanna thank the New York State Permanent Judicial Commission for Justice for Children for partnering with the Institute to bring this event to you. The commission is chaired by Judge Karen Peters and was established in 1988 to improve the lives and life chances of children involved with New York courts. Its members include judges, lawyers, advocates, physicians, legislators, and state and local officials. To moderate the conversation today, I would like to introduce you to the Permanent Commission's Executive Director, Ms. Kristen Conklin. Kristen joined the commission in 2018. Prior to that, she served as Investigative Counsel in the New York State offices of the Inspector General, and as Special Assistant Attorney General in the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit of the New York State Office of the Attorney General. During her tenure as Senior Assistant District Attorney in Rockland County, Kristen implemented two very successful youth-oriented programs. And prior to that, as Assistant County Attorney for Westchester County in New York, she represented the Department of Social Services in the prosecution of child abuse and neglect cases in family court. Kristen believes that youth involved with the courts should be heard, they should be believed, they should be respected, and they should leave in a better place than they were upon entering. And she works every day to make that reality for every youth. Kristen, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you in the organization of this event. Welcome. Our guest today is award-winning author, and a renowned social justice scholar. With three decades of experience in the areas of education, civil rights, juvenile and social justice, she has written prolifically about social justice issues. Two of her books, Push Out, The Criminalization of Black Girls in Schools, published by the New Press in 2016, and Sing a Rhythm, Dance of Blues, Education for the Liberation of Black and Brown Girls, which came out in 2019, inspired the powerful documentary Push Out, which was aired by PBS and which she also produced and co-wrote. Her star power cannot be understated. Her 2018 TED Talk on how to stop the criminalization of black girls in schools has received more than 1.7 million views and has been translated into 18 languages. Her work has been profiled by MSNBC, C-SPAN 2, The Washington Post, The New York Times, NPR, and PBS, among other national and local print, radio, and television media. Somehow, amidst all of that, in early 2020, she became the inaugural executive director of Grant Makers for Girls of Color, a philanthropic collaborative that supports a world in which all girls and young women of color are healthy, safe, thriving, and fully empowered to dream and shape their desired reality on their terms, while dismantling structural barriers created by racism, sexism, ageism, and other forms of oppression that prevent their full participation in our country's future. She is also the founder of the National Black Women's Justice Institute. She has taught at St. Mary's College of California, at the University of San Francisco, and at California State University in Sacramento. She is a 2012 Soros Justice Fellow the former Vice President for Economic Programs, Advocacy and Research at the NAACP, 
and the former director of research for the Felton E. Henderson Center for Social Justice at the UC Berkeley Law School. Throughout her career, she has also worked in partnership with and has served as a consultant for federal, state, and county agencies, national, academic, and research institutions, and communities throughout the nation to develop research, comprehensive approaches, and training curricula to eliminate racial, ethnic, and gender disparities in justice and education systems. And if that isn't enough, she also frequently lectures on the life and the legacy of the artist Prince. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Monique Morris. Dr. Morris, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me. <laughs> um, it has been it has been a bit of a journey this morning to be heard. And so I am uh, thrilled to be here with you all and deeply appreciate the opportunity to share some of my thoughts about social justice, to spend a little time with you on this question of how black girls are uniquely impacted by criminalization and to talk through some of the things that we might be able to do uh, to interrupt these cycles of violence that so many of our young people experience. Um, it is a beautiful day in New York. And so I'm really happy uh, that I get a little bit of sun even as I'm talking to you uh, this afternoon. Um, as has been mentioned, I lead a philanthropic organization called Grant Makers for Girls of Color, which we affectionately call G4GC. It's a philanthropic organization that works to advance conditions for girls, femmes, and gender expansive youth who identify as black, indigenous, and other people of color um, so that they can achieve equity and realize bold and just futures in the United States and beyond. Um, we organize within philanthropy to increase the capacity of organizations to support and resource girls of color. And we resource organizations led by women, girls, and femmes working to improve conditions for girls of color. Prior to this work, um, as has been mentioned, I led uh, and founded the National Black Women's Justice Institute where I engaged in research training and technical assistance to reduce the criminalization of black girls in schools. And as part of this work, I helped to design and launch an educational reentry program for girls um, who have experienced school pushout. Uh, we call the program Emerge, which stands for um, educating, mentoring, empowering, and reaffirming our girls for excellence. It's a partnership between NBWJI and a local community-based organization called the Mentoring Center and the County Office of Education. The majority of the girls that were referred to us in juvenile court, or, or the majority of the girls who were referred to us were referred by the juvenile court system. Um, they were girls who had experienced school pushout. Um, they were not being well served by any other traditional or alternative school in the county um, in which it's located. And I offer that really at the outset of this conversation because I want to share that my work on this question of how push out impacts black girls is not only theoretical or exploratory for me, it's about engaging in participatory practices that help us discover and test practical solutions to this issue. So um, if I could take it back a few years, early in the conversation, um, especially now that I know that there are um, other scholars and students and practitioners uh, in this conversation and, and folks that may be joining from outside of the United States, um, let me anchor us a little bit in the, the narrative as it's been developing on this question of girls uh, in, the, in the justice system and, and particularly along the pathways to confinement. Early in the conversation about the school to prison pipeline, um, which was the framework that had been uh, used to capture you know, what was happening in our, our society, um, discipline data were being collected and analyzed by the United States Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights. It was only being collected though, analyzed and presented by race and sex. So we could tell how many people were being impacted by racial group and we knew how many people, uh, boys were being impacted or girls were being impacted by exclusionary discipline. But the data were not disaggregated in a way that was useful to those of us who were recognizing the emergence of trends in the public uh, domain that suggested a need to examine what was happening with girls of color and specifically with black girls. We were hearing of cases uh, around the country that included six and seven year old black girls being arrested for having a tantrum in their classrooms or black girls getting suspended for wearing head wraps during black history month 
or thrown, uh, black girls being thrown by school resource officers um, around their classrooms and in other spaces in the schools. But at the time, there wasn't a discussion um, of how these were not isolated incidents, but rather a pattern of violence against black girls. Then the UCLA Center for Civil Rights mined the existing national data and discovered that black girls were not surprisingly overrepresented among girls experiencing exclusionary discipline. They were the first really to reveal that the racial disparities um, were actually greater among girls than they were among boys. But that was inconsistent with the dominant narrative of the time, uh, which framed the school to prison pipeline as we were calling it as almost entirely a men and boys issue. All the comparisons that were being made between black boys and black girls um, were, in, were, were I, I argue, designed so that girls were essentially being lost. It's actually an apples to oranges comparison, which I talk about in the book Push Out, um, because boys in general are more likely to experience exclusionary discipline than girls. So um, placing girls in the same conversation with the activity of boys was already uh, a conversation that was uh, tilted uh, from the very beginning. The more appropriate method is to compare what is happening and look at what's happening among boys and then to analyze what is happening among girls. When that happened, we were able to see that black girls were the only group of girls who were overrepresented across the spectrum of discipline and at every educational level. The scholars at UCLA found that in some of the largest districts, the racial disparities were so great among girls that the ranking actually went um, black boys being ex those who experienced uh, exclusionary discipline the greatest to black girls, then other boys, then other girls. So the racial disparity was so great that black girls were showing up in the numbers that were closer to the boys. So we had work to do. After a significant amount of advocacy, uh, the United States Department of Ed uh, then began to report data disaggregated by race and ability for boys and girls. Again, documenting disparities that remain. The most recent data show that after 20 years, our nation's public schools unfortunately remain locations for increasingly punitive and racially divided locations for punishment, particularly for schools populated with black bodies. Just last month, in the midst of a pandemic, cases were reported of black girls being forcefully handled by law enforcement uh, and those began to circulate, including a devastating one of a teenage girl in Florida who was lifted by an officer, slammed to the concrete and then handcuffed while she lay unconscious on the ground. Um, we've been focused on this question of how we then interrupt these pathways to confinement, how we interrupt this violence, this routine violence that our girls are experiencing, not just in the egregious cases like the ones that I'm sharing with you today, but also in the everyday interactions that facilitate um, a pushing out of black girls disproportionately, but of all our children who are experiencing disruptions uh, in school. Um, you know, I spent the better part of maybe the last six years talking about this, this school to confinement pathways or school push out. And what I mean by that um, is that I'm, I'm talking about the, the policies, the practices, the conditions and the prevailing consciousness that facilitate um, an increased risk of contact with the juvenile court or criminal legal system. All of those decisions that are made, all of those actions that are taken and what we think about black girls that renders them vulnerable to future contact or current contact with the juvenile court or criminal legal system. And um, in this time frame, I think we've been able to establish that there are a number of activities that can reduce the number of girls who are pushed out or pushed into the criminal legal system. But while an increasing number of schools are developing alternative practices designed to divert students from exclusionary discipline, um, and in-school suspensions is counted among those exclusionary disciplinary practices, um, although sometimes people frame them as the alternative, but they're still missing school instruction time and it's still a disciplinary action. Um, we know that racial disparities persist among those who remain along the pathways to confinement. The most recent data of national uh, stats on the school discipline um, conducted by the Georgetown or analyzed by the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality found that black girls are still approximately four times more likely than white girls to face suspension and expulsion 
and are 5.3 times more likely to be transferred to an alternative school for disciplinary reasons. It's also worth noting that across the spectrum of discipline, Black girls continue to experience a greater racial disparity than their male counterparts. For example, Black boys are nearly 2.6 times more likely than white boys to experience suspension, while Black girls are four times more likely than white girls to experience suspension. Black boys are just under two and a half times more likely than white boys to be arrested on campus, while Black girls are 3.6 times more likely than white girls to experience the same. So push out or the criminalization of our youth is reflected in the overrepresentation that we see among discipline, but it also involves a host of other activities that we know to be a part of this tapestry of harm and this culture of punishment that is facilitating a push out of our girls disproportionately. High stakes testing can push students away. Surveillance on and off campus can push students away. I talk a bit about that in Push Out uh, the Book, in Push Out the Film, and in Sing a Rhythm, Dance a Blues, uh, because there are a host of instruments of surveillance that have entered our schools, in, including school resource officers and security uh, measures that uh, unfortunately do not respond to the core issues of trauma and life disruption that is leading to some of the negative student behaviors that we're asking police to solve. We ask too much of law enforcement uh, in our schools and they are not equipped to fully respond to the needs that our girls have. Um, I was co-author of a study with Georgetown Center on any poverty and inequality that looked at school resource officers and girls of color. And uh, we, it was a participatory study that looked at what officers were learning, how they were engaging, what their thinking was, what their training was, um, what MOUs are in place. And what we found is that there's a very arbitrary way in which law enforcement is engaged in the United States. There's no uniform way across the board that they are engaged in schools. And thus you have some schools where school resource officers are heavily trained, where they are engaged as youth development workers. And then you have other school locations where you have state troopers who are coming in who don't know the children, who, who don't uh, care to know the children, unfortunately, and who are leading with their badge and not with this notion of them being a youth development worker. At the end of the study, both law enforcement officers and girls of color um, agreed that it was the officers who had the youth development experience and expertise that were the most effective at building relationships with young people to facilitate safety, not those officers who were leading with um, their badge and with punishment, which means that you don't need a badge and with punishment to facilitate safety, you need to be a good youth development worker. These are the kinds of things um, that we've been exploring over time, uh, the types of issues that are are difficult sometimes for our society to embrace because we've become so connected to in our narratives, this notion that law enforcement equals safety. But we do have to engage in a deeper interrogation that involves having conversations with our young people about what they actually need to feel safe. And when we've spoken with girls, particularly black girls and other girls of color, it's clear that they're looking for something other than the presence of law enforcement to keep them safe. They're looking for other institutional practices that can facilitate a wellness and a condition and climate that engages them and their whole selves rather than uh, that polices their bodies or renders them vulnerable to other forms of surveillance. Dress code policies and other school codes of conduct can lead to adultification and dehumanization or amplify this adultification and dehumanization that we see to produce poor educational and life outcomes. Most recently we saw in, in Rochester, unfortunately, a nine-year-old girl um, having an interaction with law enforcement where she had to actually remind these adult law enforcement officers that she was a child at nine years old. Um, adultification is something that is playing an increasingly large role. I'm glad that people are now talking about it more uh, publicly um, with, to understand the ways in which adults will read the behaviors of young people as adult-like, especially if it is in the body, if, if it is in a black female body, um, and that black female body is a young one. Um, the Georgetown Center on Poverty and Inequality did another study that looked at adultification and you know, built from the brilliant work of Dr. Jamelia Blake um, in, in examining the points at which black girls become particularly vulnerable in these spaces. And they found that black girls were 
experiencing adultification when they're as young as five years old, and that it peaks when they're between the ages of 10 and 14, which means that Black girls are being seen as more adult-like and therefore less worthy of protection, less worthy of comfort, less worthy of nurturing, to know more about adult subject matter like sex, and to be perceived as more independent than their white counterparts. When they are as young as five years old, and then again, when they're between the ages of 10 and 14 is when it's at its absolute worst. That's middle school. And so when we're thinking about the times in which, or the, the framework um, of their lives when they're experiencing um, puberty, um, for many black girls, they get early onset puberty, uh, their bodies are shifting, their emotions are shifting, their brains are trying to adjust, and we have built in a system in their educational and learning space that receives them as more adult-like and therefore is more inclined to treat them with harsher responses for similar activities. Study after study have shown that black girls um, are responded to when they engage in similarly situated types of behaviors with their white counterparts in more punitive and harsh ways. Chewing gum, one student may get a warning, the other student gets kicked out. Um, having a phone on in class, one student may get a warning, the other one um, will get removed from the school or, or sent to the dean or the principal's office. Um, having a fight on campus, um, unfortunately, we've heard narrative after narrative of uh, black girls under recognizing that the adults will talk to and engage um, a student who is not black in trying to understand what has happened with the black student. It is an, about calling in law enforcement and engaging in acts of force that can facilitate harm in other ways. So there's this differential treatment that black girls are recognizing, that uh, increasingly the public is recognizing and that the data are reflecting that show that this adultification is not just um, something that lives in our minds that may inform how we are, you know, engaging Black girls um, in our own perceived uh, consciousness or in our own imagination, but rather it does actually impact how we then make decisions about their futures and how we engage them even in the agency that they have in articulating what a just and liberated future looks like for them. Much of this um, that I have uh, talked about is also rooted in some of the historical stereotypes and tropes that still inform the consciousness in the United States about black girlhood. Um, I'm thrilled to see so many um, universities now really thinking about what black girlhood studies might mean. Um, but we know that the understanding of black women and girls as somehow sassy and disruptive or um, the tropes that surround Black femininity uh, that read her as hypersexual or that read her as combative um, certainly are playing out in our learning spaces and facilitating harm in those learning spaces. They certainly play out in correctional facilities and institutions that are engaged with our girls. Um, I remember reading several studies a couple of years back about how probation officers would read the behaviors of uh, black girls as um, being more manipulative um, or them intentionally engaging in, in the manipulation of uh, their environments than they would the boys and that they, and then they would um, white girls. And so it's really important to think about how these uh, stereotypes inform our own understanding and our own behaviors when we're interacting with young people in crisis. There's also these conditions that are happening um, around the country um, that involve you know, disturbing schools laws or the ways that we've constructed laws that criminalize normal adolescent behavior. Um, you know, our effort in the push out conversation is to look at all of the factors that are contributing to this tapestry of harm in the lives of black girls and then to seek remedy and intervention in a way that can facilitate healing. Ultimately, that's what this work is about. That means that we have to examine those laws that are codified to essentially make criminal behaviors like loitering, like speaking loudly to a teacher, um, <laughs> like being obnoxious or annoying. You know, actual laws that say that about teenage young people always lead me to question, you know, if anyone has spent time recently with a teenager and knows how they are engaged or remembers a time when they weren't a teenager and maybe someone found them a bit annoying. It may be rude, it may be disruptive, it should not be against the law. 
it is about normal adolescent behavior and the developing adolescent brain. And I love that the emergent neuroscience is inviting us into a conversation about that because I think the more we understand about our own developing brains and the more educators understand about the developing adolescent brain, the less likely they'll be to engage in punitive and harsh responses when young people are exhibiting that they, this, this sense of, of danger or their response to a perception of danger or perception of harm and instead bring them in when they need to um, be in community with us. Um, I, I said in the TED talk that when young people are, are experiencing a disruption that it's critically important for us to bring them in closer rather than push them away. And so, you know, what I mean by that is when young people are experiencing a disruption in their lives, those are the children that are most unsafe. Um, we tend to structure our policies and practices as if that child must be removed from the community in order for the community to be safe. My argument and the argument of those who have been studying this for a while and who have been looking at intervention strategies is that by isolating that young person, we're actually causing greater harm because that's where the pain festers. That is where the isolation can lead to a deeper uh, form of disconnection and dysregulation. And that's when they come back and, and engage um, in harm in the community. Um, you know, there, there are multiple, you know, sort of ancient sayings uh, about how children will, uh, you know, seek to engage um, those who need to be in community with them. And one of my favorites is, you know, an African uh, proverb that says, you know, a child that is not feeling love from the community will light a fire to burn the village in order to feel its warmth, right? And so it's really important for us to understand that isolating children is not the solution. Even if it's a temporary uh, term for us to say, if someone needs a, a moment to uh, engage in some way of thinking about their own um, activities and, and, and reconnection to community, it has to always be with that intention and it has to always be about healing and it has to always be about establishing a relationship, not just a removal from the school. That's where we have the deepest um, uh, issues occurring. So I wrote Push Out after, um, you know, I had written a, a number of other books and and documents exploring how we bring ourselves deeper into community. And it was really important for me to do that because I was learning and you know, sort of shaping my own engagement around this issue um, from this idea that if we bring our young people in closer, if we bring our young people into community with us, what do we get? And what do we get when we push them out and move them away from us? Um, and I wrote Push Out after I had written a street novel called Too Beautiful for Words, which um, explored this issue of prostitution. Um, it's the story of a 17 year old um, who is commercially sexually exploited. It's before we were using that framework to understand that there is no such thing as a child prostitute. Um, and it was during a time when much of hip hop culture was uh, celebrating uh, this notion of exploitation as a strategy um, for personal development. Uh, and I wanted to challenge that. And so I wrote a street novel that was really based upon what I was hearing from having entered a number of juvenile detention facilities throughout the United States at the time as a researcher. And I recognized that not everybody was gonna read the research bulletin, right? <laughs> that I was gonna having conversations with young people and engaging in focus groups, but not all those young people, probably none of those young people would actually pick up the research bulletin and recognize what it is that I wanted to say. And so I wanted to have a conversation with them about what is facilitating a criminalization in our communities, not just having conversations about the prison industrial system, although that's an important framework. Locating the conversation in prison language really privileges the conditions of men who are disproportionately there um, in, in, or in those spaces. I wanted to have a conversation about the grander criminalization that so many of our young people are experiencing. And we don't see so many youth in prisons. We see youth in residential facilities. We see youth in detention centers or the you know, secure correctional facilities. And that nomenclature is not one that sort of circulates in the public domain. Folks don't really think about all the various you know, sort of tiers of criminalization as they manifest in our community or the full complete continuum that probation holds around the possibility of surveillance and, and, and response to uh, criminalization. And so it was important for me in all of these projects to start to have conversations in different ways with different communities. 
both those that were impacted by these conditions and those who would be part of the tapestry of seeking healing. After that, I worked with Kemba Smith on her biography, um, exploring the impact of mandatory minimum sentencing and had an opportunity to engage in a very personal uh, narrative with her about uh, the role of domestic violence and intimate partner violence in facilitating some of the criminalization that women and girls experience and the way that it shapes their understanding of how they can, are interacting with some of the um, institutions that they're involved in, educational institutions, but also how the judicial system has failed to see that trauma, recognize that trauma, and instead um, still seeks to engage in a very harsh uh, form of punishment when women um, are survivors of deep uh, traumas. Uh, and to recognize that particularly in among black women and girls, they may be both angry and also survivors of this, this form of violence, that one doesn't preclude the other, that there is no sort of profile of a victim or survivor of domestic violence and intimate partner violence that is not somehow inclined to um, you know, sort of respond in a way that they want them to. Each person is going to respond the way that is best for them in their moment of, of crisis or as, you know, in, in terms of what is available to them at any given time. And so it's really important uh, to think about all of that and all of that was informing how I was writing Push Out and what I was thinking about with Push Out. Um, I also wrote Black Stats, African Americans by the Numbers in the 21st century prior to writing Push Out. And so um, I was always clear that the data were important for our understanding, but it's really a collection. Push Out and Singer Rhythm Dance of Blues are really um, a, a, a you know, sort of body, they're the product of a body of work um, that has explored this issue for so long and really thinking about how our women and girls have been engaged in this work and also rendered invisible by some of the narratives um, in, in this work. Each of these pro projects um, complemented the empirical research that I was leading at various um, academic nonprofit and civil rights organizations. And what became abundantly clear is that we were driving too many of our young people into the juvenile court and criminal legal system, fostering delinquency rather than interrupting it. So the Push Out documentary, which was based on the last two books, um, Push Out and Sing a Rhythm, Dance of Blues, Education for the Liberation of Black and Brown Girls, expanded this exploration into film. And in doing so, um, served as an invitation for others to join the inquiry about how schools can play a stronger role in interrupting the cycle. Um, in Sing a Rhythm, Dance of Blues and the film, um, I argue and, and, and in, really I, I'm just, you know, pleading with people <laughs> to understand that schools need to be locations for healing so that they can be locations for learning. If there's any contribution that I make to this conversation, I want people to understand that schools need to be locations for healing in order for them to be locations for learning. It is something that I have learned as an educator. It's something that I have learned as a facilitator of programs. It is something that I have learned as a researcher. It is something that I have learned as an advocate. It is important for young people to feel that they are loved in these spaces, not that they are being surveilled. Safety is not the same as accountability or punishment is not the same as accountability and safety is not the same thing as, as law enforcement. And we have to expand our understanding of how we facilitate healing so that we can engage in the radical um, work of transforming young people who are survivors of deep systems of oppression and multiple forms of oppression in some cases um, into those adults that we know can be thriving and, and whole and thus uh, effective members of our society. It's an invitation really for us to explore why we should pull students in closer again when they're in crisis rather than push them away how we can understand the need for trauma responsive schools and avoid the creation of maladaptive classrooms or maladaptive systems. Um, and those maladaptive systems are those which, which deepen harm rather than respond to the harm. If our schools become trauma responsive, not just trauma informed, um, uh, much of the conversation that we've been having about institutions is that they, we want them to be trauma informed. Yes, we want you to know about the trauma, but more than that, we want you to engage your understanding of the trauma to create new systems that respond to that and that uh, cultivate a safety, an emotional safety, a spiritual safety, uh, an intellectual safety, and a physical safety 
for there to be the kind of learning that we want to take place in schools that is taking place in some schools, particularly and disproportionately in schools that are not overwhelmingly black and brown. And so um, it is important for us to map those margins, um, particularly for our most vulnerable students, students with disabilities, uh, students who identify as LGBTQ+, um, are trans girls of color, uh, were part of the narrative for uh, push out, um, you know, particularly black trans girls who have been engaged in, uh, you know, uh, some, some very deep explorations of their own girlhood, who have been uh, rendered disposable by so much of society, um, and that often are left out of our conversations. It's important to bring them in. Again, I feel that no child is disposable. And so much of this work around push out is about the challenge for us to engage in the development of policies, um, equity policies and discussions that are intentional and intersectional in their language. Um, our, in, our, our sort of radical revision of some of the dress code policies and co-construction of those policies with girls who are living with this um, experience so that they can uh, not facilitate oppression in any way and be very intentional and explicit about that. Um, to also think about uh, and, and moving toward replacing law enforcement in schools with counselors, clinicians, and other youth development uh, specialists, um, understanding that young people, again, when they're dysregulated, will need some other interventions, not to be uh, physically harmed or arrested or handcuffed in the halls, but rather to have someone who can engage in other de-escalation techniques and uh, regulation uh, techniques to help us move to a, a, a safer space for every child. We want to build curricula um, and other school-based structures that don't teach to the oppression, but rather that are rooted in collective liberation for our students. Um, over and over again, when I talk about intellectual safety as being a part of our cultivation um, of whole systems and our rejection of, tapestry, of schools performing as, as part of the tapestry of harm, um, I often talk about the curriculum because it is important for our students to see themselves in the curriculum, for them to feel that they are present in the schools, and it does facilitate also an opportunity for them to recognize that they are not tangential to these narratives about American uh, existence or what they're learning in schools or their role in the global society, but to really engage them in a way of knowing that uh, tells them they are worthy of inquiry, that tells them that they belong in school and that what they are um, becoming is a part of a, a society that values them, not that views them um, as disposable. We also need to bridge the research-based best practices to counter criminalization in schools with the design of the school day and curriculum itself, uh, really looking at the development of affinity spaces, again, counselors, volunteers, and the development of relationships that facilitate empathetic responses to student misbehavior. Institute yoga, mindfulness, restorative approaches. These are all strategies that have been uh, working in schools across the globe, really, to center students when they are um, experiencing a disruption, to re-engage them when they are disconnected or when there is conflict. Every time a student gets in trouble, that is not that should not be seen as an opportunity for us to get rid of another one. That should be seen as an opportunity for us to bring them in and understand what is happening and to build out our schools uh, to function the way that I think they should, which is as part of the tapestry of healing, not as a part of the tapestry of harm. We also have to tell the truth with our data and our understanding of systems um, so that we are not constructing criminality. We have to think about this as an opportunity for us to create remedy and develop structures for equity, um, but also the tools that help us continue a rigorous intersectional framework in our articulation of justice. We use the term social justice to apply to just about everything. <laughs> and it's important for us to get specific. What does it look like to have a system that is just and liberated for Black girls? What does it, what needs to be in place? Who needs to be at the table? My argument is that these are co-constructed and you must have Black girls at the table. My favorite articulation of justice comes from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who offered that justice is power correcting everything that stands against love. And for me, that's an invitation for us to lead with love and us to think about our policies, our practices, our conditions, 
and our understanding of black girls through a, a really dichotomous lens that says, is this leading with love or is this leading with fear? So much of what we've constructed, the push out, the school to confinement pathways, the school to prison pipeline, those have been embedded in fear. What could it look like if we say, let's center love. Let's think about justice as being power that, that is correcting everything that stands against love. Let's think about what that is. That means that we are not gonna push people away. It means that we will engage the, these young people as sacred. We will create institutions and build relationships and try to repair uh, conditions in communities that facilitate harm such that these young people feel whole and connected to their place of learning and to each other and to us. This is about you know, us, us understanding that criminalization is what we produce when we lead with fear and liberation is what we get when we ultimately lead with love. And so I'm, I'm looking at the time and I know we wanna have some time for Q&A. So I'll pause there and I thank you so much for giving me a chance to share some of these initial thoughts with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morris. And um, I'm gonna let you catch your breath, but I think I can speak for most of us uh, participating here today that we could listen to you for, for another few hours before we before we ask you to pause. Um, we, uh, as many- The graph that's been created, I didn't see this happening. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, we have to give a special thanks to our visual note taker, Angelique McAlpin, for her wonderful uh, talent and ability um, in bringing some life uh, to your words as you said them. Um, and as many of you have learned uh, through the chat, we, we, we don't have time to take live questions, but we did uh, ask people to provide questions ahead of time um, that, that we did, uh, that we will kind of get through as many as we can. Um, before we start there, I did wanna ask in, in viewing the documentary Push Out, um, there is a, a statement in there that, that what is happening with this, um, this with the, with the black girls and how, how they are being pushed out and the treat, disparate treatment of them is in fact a crisis. I don't think it's suggested, I think it's stated. And I, I given my experience and, and my research in this area, I would agree with that. How, how do we get our leaders to prioritize this crisis when we are in the midst of so many? I think it's important, and thank you for that question. I think it's really important for us to understand that um, black girls and other girls of color are living their lives at the intersection of multiple conditions and multiple oppressions. So while we can articulate um, you know, that this is a crisis and, and we do explicitly say that in the film, um, I say that it's not perceived as a national crisis but it should be perceived as a national crisis. We have to address the very obvious ways in which you know, cis hetero patriarchy informs our understanding of who is at risk um, and how we seek remedy to risk. So our own understanding um, of risk has to shift. Um, one of the first papers that I wrote about this was race, gender and the school to prison pipeline, um, expanding our discussion to include black girls. Uh, because I went through the literature and found almost no place where we, <laughs> we could see girls and realize that a lot of that was because we had framed the issue in a way that privileges the conditions of boys and the activities of boys. And so we were losing girls. We weren't talking about dress code policies. We weren't talking about sexual violence. We weren't talking about intimate partner violence in that conversation. We weren't talking about the tropes about being combative and hypersexualized and all these things that were leading the numbers of girls to go up. Um, and even as the numbers for boys were going down, it's, it's, it was important for us to shift our own understanding about how um, girls enter into these conditions and how they are impacted by our definitions of delinquency. And so, um, you know, I think that's part of what is happening here is that we get into this space where we either feel it has to be an oppression Olympics. So there's only room for one crisis and one person has to have the deepest crisis in order for us to prioritize it, um, which to me is a deficit model that um, really has no place if we are engaging justice as you know, an, an infinite possibility for all of us. Um, but also really thinking about um, 
the, the need for us to embrace our own collective understanding of crisis through an intersectional lens. So I'm not gonna use that term intersectionality without pausing for a second to just explain that it is a term that was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, who is a brilliant legal theorist um, who brought us into critical race theory through this mapping um, of what she calls mapping the margins. And it's an understanding that um, a person is, is engaged with and impacted by systems um, and you know, other people um, as a function of their own intersecting multiple identities. So while we were describing this condition and we described crisis, even safety, um, with this understanding that it is um, disproportionate, there's a way that we conflate a disproportionality with being the sole group in, in impacted. And, and so we talk about safety from the lens of state violence against black men in public, right? And there was a way that we were doing the same thing for this school to prison pipeline, where we, because we were saying that boys were just, black boys especially were disproportionately overrepresented and they are, um, that there was no place for us to understand the ways that black girls were also being disproportionately impacted or for us to even map what was happening because we were so laser-like focused on this narrative that only the boys were impacted. And so when we get people to look at the data and we, you know, I start, that's why I talked a little bit about the way that data were collected and how we were analyzing data. When we do that kind of baseline work, we open up the field for us to engage in different forms of inquiry and also to bring in other methodologies that can invite us to, to do the deeper dives in, in various aspects of the work. You know, we're not asking everybody to do everything. We just want the baseline data so that we can also be a part of the discussion so that we can be part of framing this in a way that allows for it to be as expansive as it needs to be. Because ultimately, again, this is about seeking remedy. Um, and, you know, justice is, you know, social justice is a noun, but it, not to me, right? <laughs> so, so it is, you know, and, and I don't think Dr. King was receiving it as a noun either, right? Like it's about power correcting everything that stands against love. That is a verb, right? It's, a, it's an action. And so we want to really think about um, prioritizing things in a way that invites us to not engage in a hierarchy of oppressions to borrow language from Audre Lorde but rather to think about justice as being expansive, justice as being something that we can ultimately respond to. And that's where we have found success. We found success with principals who begin to understand how they can collect data differently. We find success with judicial systems that understand that they can uh, re even engage in relationships with community-based organizations differently if they prioritize um, this issue and understand it differently and expansively. And we find that we can even engage with legislators differently. Um, you know, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley introduced the Ending Push Out Act in 2019. She's going to reintroduce it uh, soon because there are other ways that we need to construct the framework um, so that we can engage in conversations that allow for us to do these deep dives. And we need data, we need framework, we need conversations, we need action, and we need our young people who are at the center of this inquiry. Um, we started, uh, I have a partnership with the United State of Women uh, to develop the Principal Demands, which is a toolkit essentially, um, co-constructed with young people that even invites young people into this conversation to hold space in their local institutions with their local communities about how they can access um, their own language and agency in articulating how we respond to this. So how we get leaders to prioritize this crisis is by doing all of those things and ultimately not letting up when people tell us it's a niche issue. So taking it from kind of the broad, the broad view to the more narrow view within schools, what strategies do you suggest um, staff, frontline staff, such as teachers and, and school social workers employ to have conversations with upper level management about doing this work and changing the practices that are going on? So that's why I mentioned the uh, principal demands. It has in it a set of questions that can be taken at the local level to launch those spaces. Um, we've developed a number of toolkits. The National Women's Law Center has a toolkit called Let Her Learn that also um, in, sort of ticks through several 
um, core questions and also um, you know, establishes some legal parameters for those questions that educators, counselors, parents, community members can take to a local community and begin to explore. Um, and I think you know, it's important to see these as more than a, a campaign, but also to understand that those of us who are elevating this issue are really trying to do something different. And so look for the toolkits that we have prepared because they definitely sort of lead you through a conversation. You can also go to the pushoutfilm.com website. In there are a series of resources, particularly for educators. There are professional development materials. There are uh, discussion questions that they can lead in peer groups or with administrators. Um, it's all laid out there um, for folks who wanna just do a deeper dive. Um, it doesn't always require that you have seen the film or that you read the books, but obviously that helps. Um, there's a lot of also free material in, in the, and material in the public domain that we've been producing that help uh, schools respond differently and launch conversations that are critical at this point. I will say it's also really important for educators um, and anyone who is really working and seeking to engage in this issue to bring girls who are impacted by this issue into the conversation. Um, I don't believe that we should be thinking about conversations of equity or remedy or um, even understanding the issue without involving them in this issue. So girls, Black girls have to be at the center of this. Black girls have to be um, safe enough to share their truths uh, and they need to be with uh, adults that they trust and know to, in order for them to, um, you know, I think fully participate in articulating what it looks like for them and what they need to be in place. But all of the things that we have laid out, please don't do them without girls. <laughs> Definitely noted. Thank you. Um, I have about maybe 60 seconds. I'm going to try to get you in, get one more question in. Um, you know, in talking about this, can you give us examples of um, many, any locations that um, have made strides to eradicate the push-out practices? Yeah, we highlight one in the push-out documentary, the Columbus City Prep School for Girls, and I talk about them in the TED Talk too, um, quickly. Uh, they are profiled on the pushoutfilm.com site. And I spent a lot of time talking about the Columbus City Prep School for Girls because they have an infrastructure in place that's really important. They have built out and are seeking to uh, think through even today how to continue with the expansion of this work. Um, but they have instituted several key practices at the school site that have um, made a tremendous uh, impact um, in terms of positive student performance, but also in terms of uh, a lowering of truancy rates um, and increase and in improvement in student performance. Because obviously when students are in school and they are participating in learning, they perform better on the assessments. And so it is um, you know, a really great example of how one school can come together with strong leadership to institute practices at the very beginning of school that involve goal setting, that involve um, meeting in community and establishing relationships to assigning uh, an adult uh, you know, person to be a safe person for every student on campus, which is something that needs to be in every school. Um, we know that young people who have at least one adult on campus that they can trust can lead to a reduction in um, a reliance on exclusionary discipline. And so making sure that there is that infrastructure in place, instituting the restorative justice programming, the social emotional learning programming, the um, arts and, 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 and other athletic activities is all critically important. So um, spend some time on the pushoutfilm.com website. There are a lot of resources there, especially for educators. Thank you so much. And that's going to bring um, this particular session to a close. Dr. Morris, I want to thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to allow you an opportunity to log out and get ready for our leadership session, which is thank starting uh, right now. Um, to can everyone else, question? all of our participants, I'm sorry, go ahead. Can I ask, can I get a copy of these beautiful images? <laughs> They're so great. Yes, we are getting thumbs up from thank Dr. You. Lopez. So we will, we will make that happen. For <laughs> thank sure. you so much. Thank, thank you, you so much. And I will see you shortly uh, in the leadership <laughs> session. To all of our participants, thank you so much for being with us today. I want to remind everyone that we have provided access to the Push Out documentary. Um, it is available for free if you registered for this session until February 28th. So please uh, log in. The link was provided to you in the email for the registration for this session. 
Those of you who are joining us in the leadership session, please take the opportunity to log out of this session and click the link for the leadership session, and we will see you in a moment. Thank you all for joining with us. Special thanks to everyone at the YJI who helped us uh, per, uh, bring this to you with all of the technology and all of the work that went into behind the scenes. And again, a special thanks to Dr. Lopez and our visual note taker, Angelique McAlpin. Thank you and have a wonderful day.